Hello, fellow adventurers. It is day 71 and we are in Singapore. So I'm doing something a little different this time because I'm celebrating my birthday. And my husband and I were in Singapore in 2009 when they were building the Marina Bay Sands Hotel. It cost $5.6 billion to build this hotel. And on the 57th floor, there are three restaurants and an infinity pool. And this place is awesome. And while they were building it, before we said, we're gonna go back, and I said, yep, let's do it. So we not only got a room for the night, at one of the restaurants, I invited 20 people from the ship and we celebrated my birthday looking at all the lights and light shows and buildings in Singapore. We met for the first time my son Nicholas and his wife Alexandra because they're going to be joining the cruise with us and we had lunch at Spago's and I embraced three of the drinks that were called Peace on Earth and we had lunch overlooking the infinity pool. This is such an epic place. Next, I had my big birthday party at night and it was so much fun and very, very memorable. So the pool and the three restaurants are on the 57th floor. In fact, if you're looking at the picture, it looks like a surfboard on top of three pillars. The next day, we got up early and went swimming in the pool around 6.30 and then went over to Gardens by the Bay, which there is a biosphere with all these plants that are in them. There are two of them. One is for rainforest and the other is for more arid types of plants, but they do keep it quite cool because in Singapore, it's about 95 degrees and the humidity is as high as well. What is so exciting for Larry and I is that while we are in Singapore, our son Nicholas and his wife Alexandra also were here for several days before we got here. And he knows so much about the city, I'm going to turn it over to him to tell you all about Singapore since we spent most of our time at the Marina Bay Sands having fun. Hi, this is Nick Newman here. I spent over a week in Singapore and had a ton of fun. What's interesting about Singapore is actually it's located properly between both what we would consider the Far East and the Farther East. Uh, the joke is that it's actually, and the reality is that it's between specifically both India and China and Australia. That's why Singapore was chosen by the British to be the hub for their trade. Singapore and its government have spent a long time in the last 40 years financially planning itself to become the world, or at least in the East, the largest economic and financial center, trying to rival that of what is in China, in Hong Kong. Due to this new financial power that Singapore has found in the last 20 years and has totally grown into, is the fact that Singapore is incredibly expensive. You, people who even live there have a hard time finding both the ability to pay for their normal life and to be able to afford housing and accommodations. Nearly 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing and housing is listed and leased to you so you actually don't own the land that is below the feet of your own home but you actually you only rent the space that is inside of it and you have your lease on average between 40 and 99 years it's a uh, quite interesting and causes some friction amongst many people there because you're for the first five years of your ownership of your apartment or home because you don't own the land, you're actually also controlled in the fact that you can't sell it either or rent it out for at least the first five years. And you're only allowed one house or apartment through the public housing program. And because Singapore is so small and such a compact area, they understood early on that they were going to have a difficulty driving in this city if everybody had a car. So Singapore has one of the most outstanding places in the world for public transportation, both subway, 
buses and taxis are absolutely everywhere and absolutely run down to the second that they need to be going. I haven't seen any of the buses while I was there that was more than five minutes late, where in the United States, that would be an absolute standard. This is due to the fact that Singapore puts such a high price and cost into owning a car privately. Cars in Singapore, on average, start from a pooling system. It's called what you call a pool system. This system is where they only allow you to take a permit if that car that has was retired the previous month, then allowing you to have a permit for that car or a new car on your end. What's interesting about it is the cost for just this piece of paper to own a car is between 40 and 120,000 US dollars. And the permit only allows you to own, operate, and drive your car in the state of Singapore and the city for 10 years. And your car is connected to an automated and electronic system, which actually is connected to your bank account. So be lots of roads are controlled and you pay for different time periods, much like express lanes like we have back at home or many areas in the States where you have private highways. Well, this is the same thing and including also parking garages. So they auto deduct the amount of money for you parking your car in this spot in a certain area of town every hour and it's all done automatically. So they know who and what car is where at all times. But because of this system, it has made a massive boon to their public transportation system. Hence why I'm so m marveling at its ability to move and be on time so precisely. Because there's less cars on the road, relatively speaking, it allows for them to put more and more public transportation both on the rails and on the roads in a very uniform fashion. And they have consistently reinvested their income to reflect that in the country, hence why the public transportation is amazing. Because at the end of 10 years, you have to sell your car because your permit expires, it has made Singapore the large, second largest exporter of used cars in the world. Interestingly enough, even though the government puts so many regulations on their people about various things that go on to it in and about the country, it's fascinating that the country is what many people refer to as a no nanny state. They completely believe in you making your own way and absolutely expect it of you. Many times while I was in Singapore, people were constantly saying, nothing is free in Singapore. And this leads to the really interesting thing. It's not uncommon to see people in their 70s and even 80s still working because Singapore is so expensive to live in and the things that you have to constantly pay for, including your housing, still exists even if you retire. And the state is not affording your retirement, even though they set up funds that are personalized and identifiable into a known, your own account. All that money you're living on is still entirely the money you made throughout your life. Last but not least, the one thing I was fascinated by in Singapore was learning that the state and country has actually accumulated more land in the last 45 years. They've added a total of 25% to their total land mass in reclamation services from the ocean. And the whole financial district in Singapore was built mostly on reclaimed land itself and is almost entirely brand new, all of it being less than 10 to 15 years old. Thank you for letting me share some of the information and knowledge that I learned about Singapore while traveling there. And I'm going to turn you back over to my mother. Bye. Thank you, Nick. You did the best job and I really appreciate it. And I just want to let you know the next stop that we're going to is Thailand. First, Koh Samui, the third largest island, and second, Bangkok. In closing, my wish for you is that you will love abundantly, protect your health, and be adventurous for life. You are beautiful. Let your light shine. Aloha.